Part Four, A Woman at Moore House, Chapter Nineteen, Finding Shelter. I was put down at Whitcross, a crossroads on the moor, after travelling for two days in the coach. As it rolled away, I realised I had left my parcel inside, and given the coachman all the coins in my purse. I was alone on the open moor, with no money or possessions. Lonely white roads stretched across the great wide moors as far as the hills. I was glad to see there were no towns here, because I did not want people to question me or pity me. So I walked across the moor until I found a dry place to sleep in the shelter of a small hill. Luckily, it was a warm night with no rain. The next day was hot and sunny, but I needed food and water. So I could not stay on the moor. Taking one of the white roads, I eventually found a small village. I needed all my courage to knock on some of the doors, asking if there was any paid work I could do. None of the village people could help me, and I could not bring myself to beg for food, although by now I felt weak and faint. At the baker's, I offered to exchange my leather gloves for a small cake. But the baker's wife looked at my dirty clothes and said, "I'm sorry, but how do I know you haven't stolen them?" All I ate that day was a piece of bread, which I begged from a farmer eating his supper. I spent another night on the moor, but this time the air was cold and the ground was damp. Next day, I walked from house to house again, looking in vain for work. I was now very weak from lack of food. And I began to wonder why I should struggle to stay alive when I did not want to live. It was getting dark again, and I was alone on the moor. In the distance, I could see a faint light, and I decided to try to reach it. The wind and rain beat down on me, and I fell down several times. But finally, I arrived at a long, low house, standing rather isolated in the middle of the moor. Hiding near the door, I could just see into the kitchen through a small, uncurtained window. There was an elderly woman who might be the housekeeper mending clothes, and two young ladies who seemed to be learning a language with dictionaries. The kitchen looked so clean and bright, and the ladies so kind and sensible that I dared to knock at the door. The elderly woman opened it. But she must have thought I was a thief or a beggar, because she refused to let me speak to the young ladies. The door closed firmly, shutting me out from the warmth inside. I dropped onto the wet doorstep, worn out and hopeless, prepared to die. There, the young lady's brother found me when he returned home a few minutes later, and he insisted, much against the housekeeper's wishes, on bringing me into the house. They gave me bread and milk and asked my name. Jane Elliot, I replied. I did not want anybody to know where I had come from. To their further questions, I answered that I was too tired to speak. Finally, they helped me upstairs to a bedroom, and I sank gratefully into a warm, dry bed. For three days and nights, I lay in bed, exhausted by my experiences. And hardly conscious of my surroundings, as I was recovering, Hannah, the housekeeper, came to sit with me and told me all about the family. She had known them since they were babies. Their mother had been dead for years, and their father had died only three weeks before. The girls, Diana and Mary Rivers, had to work as governesses, as their father had lost a lot of money in business. Sinjin, their brother. Was the vicar in the nearest village, Morton? They only used this house, called Moor House, in the holidays. When I felt strong enough to get dressed and go downstairs, Diana and Mary looked after me very kindly and made me feel welcome in their pleasant home. Their brother, however, seemed stern and cold. He was between twenty-eight and thirty, fair-haired and extremely handsome. Diana and Mary were curious about my past, 
but sensitive enough to avoid asking questions which would hurt me. Sinjin, on the other hand, made determined efforts to discover who I was, but I, just as firmly, refused to explain more than necessary. I told them only that, after attending Lowood School, I became a governess in a wealthy family, where an unfortunate event, not in any way my fault, caused me to run away. That was all I was prepared to say. I offered to do any kind of work, teaching, sewing, cleaning, so that I could become independent again. Sinjin approved of my keenness to work and promised to find me some paid employment. Chapter 20 A New Home I spent a month at Moore House in an atmosphere of warm friendship. I learned to love what Diana and Mary loved, the little old grey house, the wild open moors around it, and the lonely hills and valleys where we walked for hours. I read the books they read, and we discussed them eagerly. Diana started teaching me German, and I helped Mary to improve her drawing. We three shared the same interests and opinions, and spent the days and evenings very happily together. However, Sinjin hardly ever joined in our activities. He was often away from home, visiting the poor and the sick in Morton. His strong sense of duty made him insist on going, even if the weather was very bad. But despite his hard work, I thought he lacked true happiness and peace of mind. He often stopped reading or writing to stare into the distance, dreaming perhaps of some ambitious plan. Once I heard him speak at a church service in Morton, and although he was an excellent speaker, there was a certain bitterness and disappointment in his words. He was clearly not satisfied with his present life. The holiday was coming to an end. Soon Diana and Mary would leave Moor House to return to the wealthy families in the south, where they were both governesses, and St. John would go back to the vicar's house in Morton, with Hannah, his housekeeper. Although his cold manner made it difficult for me to talk to him, I had to ask him whether he had found any employment for me. I have, he answered slowly, but remember, I am only a poor country vicar and can't offer you a job with a high salary, so you may not wish to accept it. There's already a school for boys in Morton, and now I want to open one for girls, so I've rented a building for it with a small cottage for the schoolteacher. Miss Oliver, who lives in the area and is the only daughter of a rich factory owner, has kindly paid for the furniture. Will you be the schoolteacher? You would live in the cottage rent-free and receive thirty pounds a year, no more. I thought about it for a moment. It was not as good as being a governess in an important family, but at least I would have no master. I would be free and independent. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. I accept gladly, I replied. But you do understand, he asked, a little worried. It will only be a village school. The girls will be poor and uneducated. You'll be teaching reading, writing, counting, sewing, that's all. There'll be no music or languages or painting. I understand, and I'll be happy to do it, I answered. He smiled, well satisfied with me. And I'll open the school tomorrow, if you like, I added. Very good, he agreed. Then, looking at me, he said, But I don't think you'll stay long in the village. Why not? I'm not ambitious, although I think you are. He looked surprised. I know I am, but how did you discover that? No, I think you won't be satisfied by living alone. You need people to make you happy. He said no more. Diana and Mary lost their usual cheerfulness as the moment for leaving their home and their brother came closer. You see, Jane, Diana explained, St. John is planning to become a missionary very soon. 
He feels his purpose in life is to spread the Christian religion in unexplored places where the people have never heard the word of God. So we won't see him for many years, perhaps never again. He looks quiet, Jane, but he's very determined. I know he's doing God's work, but it will break my heart to see him leave. And she broke down in tears. Mary wiped her own tears away as she said, We've lost our father. Soon we'll lose our brother too. Just then, St. John himself entered, reading a letter. Our Uncle John is dead, he announced. The sisters did not look shocked or sad, but seemed to be waiting for more information. St. John gave them the letter to read, and then they all looked at each other, smiling rather tiredly. Well, said Diana, at least we have enough money to live on. We don't really need any more. Yes, said St. John, but unfortunately we can imagine how different our lives might have been. He went out. There was a silence for a few minutes. Then Diana turned to me. Jane, you must be surprised that we don't show any sadness at our uncle's death. I must explain. We've never met him. He was my mother's brother, and he and my father quarrelled years ago about a business deal. That's when my father lost most of his money. My uncle, on the other hand, made a fortune of £20,000. As he never married and had no relations apart from us and one other person, my father always hoped we would inherit Uncle John's money. But it seems this other relation has inherited his whole fortune. Of course, we shouldn't have expected anything, but Mary and I would have felt rich with only a thousand pounds each, and St. John would have been able to help so many more poor people. She said no more, and none of us referred to the subject again that evening. The next day, the Rivers family returned to their separate places of work, and I moved to the cottage in Morton. Chapter 21 Mr. Rivers' Sacrifice I had twenty village girls to teach, some of them with such a strong country accent that I could hardly communicate with them. Only three could read, and none could write, so at the end of my first day I felt quite depressed at the thought of the hard work ahead of me. But I reminded myself that I was fortunate to have any sort of job, and that I would certainly get used to teaching these girls, who, although they were very poor, might be as good and as intelligent as children from the greatest families in England. Ever since I ran away from Thornfield, Mr Rochester had remained in my thoughts. And now, as I stood at my cottage door that first evening, looking at the quiet fields, I allowed myself to imagine again the life I could have had with him in his little white house in the south of France. He would have loved me. Oh, yes, he would have loved me very much for a while. He did love me, I thought. Nobody will ever love me like that again. But then I told myself that I would only have been his mistress in a foreign country, and for a short time, until he grew tired of me. I should be much happier here as a schoolteacher, free and honest, in the healthy heart of England. But strangely enough, St. John Rivers found me crying as he approached the cottage. Frowning at the sight of the tears on my cheeks, he asked me, Do you regret accepting this job, then? Oh, no, I replied quickly. I'm sure I'll get used to it soon, and I'm really very grateful to have a home and work to do. After all, I had nothing a few weeks ago. But you feel lonely, perhaps, he asked, still puzzled. I haven't had time to feel lonely yet. Well, I advise you to work hard and not to look back into your past. If something which we know is wrong tempts us, then we must make every effort to avoid it by putting our energy to better use. A year ago, I too was very miserable because I was bored by the routine life of a country vicar and I was tempted to change my profession. But suddenly, there was light in my darkness and God called me to be a missionary. No profession could be greater than that. 
Since that moment of truth, I have been perfectly happy making my preparations for leaving England and going abroad in the service of God. Happy, that is, except for one little human weakness which I have sworn to overcome. His eyes shone as he spoke of his great purpose in life, and I was listening, fascinated, so neither of us heard the light footsteps approaching the cottage along the grassy path. Good evening, Mr. Rivers, said a charming voice, as sweet as a bell. St. John jumped as if hit between the shoulders, then turned slowly and stiffly to face the speaker. A vision in white, with a young girlish figure, was standing beside him. When she threw back her veil, she revealed a face of perfect beauty. St. John glanced quickly at her, but dared not look at her for long. He kept his eyes on the ground as he answered, A lovely evening, but it's late for you to be out alone. Oh, father told me you'd opened the new girls' school, so I simply had to come to meet the new school teacher. That must be you, she said to me, smiling. Do you like Morton, and your pupils, and your cottage? I realised this must be the rich Miss Oliver, who had generously furnished my cottage. Yes, indeed, Miss Oliver, I replied. I'm sure I'll enjoy teaching here, and I like my cottage very much. I'll come and help you teach sometimes. I get so bored at home. Mr. Rivers, I've been away visiting friends, you know. I've had such fun. I was dancing with the officers until two o'clock this morning. They're all so charming. St. John's face looked sterner than usual, and his lip curled in disapproval as he lifted his handsome head and looked straight into Miss Oliver's laughing eyes. He breathed deeply, and his chest rose, as if his heart wanted to fly out of its cage. But he said nothing, and after a pause, Miss Oliver continued. "'Do come and visit my father, Mr. Rivers. Why don't you ever come?' I can't come, Miss Rosamond. It seemed clear to me that St. John had to struggle with himself to refuse this smiling invitation. Well, if you don't want to, I must go home then. Goodbye. She held out her hand. He just touched it, his hand trembling. Goodbye, he said in a low, hollow voice, his face as white as a sheet. They walked away in different directions. She turned back twice to look at him, but he did not turn round at all. The sight of another person's suffering and sacrifice stopped me thinking so much about my own problems. I had plenty of opportunities to observe St. John and Miss Oliver together. Every day St. John taught one Bible lesson at the school, and Miss Oliver, who knew her power over him, always chose that particular moment to arrive at the school door in her most attractive riding dress. She used to walk past the rows of admiring pupils towards the young vicar, smiling openly at him. He just stared at her, as if he wanted to say, I love you, and I know you love me. If I offered you my heart, I think you'd accept, but my heart is already promised as a sacrifice to God. But he never said anything and she always turned sadly away like a disappointed child. No doubt he would have given the world to call her back, but he would not give his chance of heaven. When I discovered that Miss Oliver's father greatly admired the Rivers family and would have no objection to her marrying a vicar, I decided to try to persuade St. John to marry her. I thought he could do more good with Miss Oliver's money in England than as a missionary under the baking sun in the East. My chance came some weeks later, when he visited me one November evening in my little cottage. He noticed a sketch I had been doing of Miss Oliver, and could not take his eyes off it. I could paint you an exact copy, I said gently, if you admit that you would like it. She's so beautiful he murmured, still looking at it. I would certainly like to have it. She likes you, I'm sure, I said, greatly daring. And her father respects you. You ought to marry her. It's very pleasant to hear this, he said, not at all shocked by my honesty. 
I shall allow myself fifteen minutes to think about her. He actually put his watch on the table and sat back in his chair, closing his eyes. Married to the lovely Rosamond Oliver. Let me just imagine it. My heart is full of delight. And there was silence for a quarter of an hour until he picked up his watch and put the sketch back on the table. Temptation has a bitter taste, he said, shaking his head. I can't marry her. You see, although I love her so deeply, I know that Rosamond would not make a good wife for a missionary. But you needn't be a missionary, I cried. Indeed, I must. It's the great work God has chosen me to do. I shall carry with me into the darkest corners of the world knowledge, peace, freedom, religion, the hope of heaven. That is what I live for and what I shall die for. What about Miss Oliver? I asked after a moment. She may be very disappointed if you don't marry her. Miss Oliver will forget me in a month and will probably marry someone who'll make her far happier than I ever could. You speak calmly, but I know you're suffering. You are original, he said, looking surprised. He had clearly not imagined that men and women could discuss such deep feelings together. But believe me, I have overcome this weakness of mine and become as hard as a rock. My only ambition now is to serve God. As he picked up his hat before leaving, something on a piece of paper on the table caught his eye. He glanced at me, then tore off a tiny piece very quickly, and with a rapid goodbye, rushed out of the cottage. I could not imagine what he had found to interest him so much. Chapter 22 Sudden Wealth When St. John left, it was beginning to snow, and it continued snowing all night and all the next day. In the evening, I sat by my fire, listening to the wind blowing outside, and had just started reading when I heard a noise. The wind, I thought, was shaking the door. But no, it was St. John, who came in out of the frozen darkness, his coat covered in snow. What's happened? I cried amazed. I thought nobody would be out in weather like this. What's the matter? There's nothing wrong he answered calmly, hanging up his coat and stamping the snow from his boots. I just came to have a little talk to you. Besides, since yesterday, I've been eager to hear the other half of your story. He sat down. I had no idea what he was referring to, and remembering his strange behaviour with a piece of paper, I began to fear that he might be going mad. He looked quite normal, however, and we made conversation for a while, although he seemed to be thinking of something else. Suddenly he said, When I arrived, I said I wanted to hear the rest of your story. But perhaps it's better if I tell the story. I'm afraid you've heard it before, but listen anyway. Twenty years ago, a poor vicar fell in love with a rich man's daughter. She also fell in love with him and married him, against the advice of all her family. Sadly, less than two years later, the couple were both dead. I've seen their grave. Their baby daughter was brought up by an aunt, a Mrs. Reed of Gateshead. You jumped. Did you hear a noise? I'll continue. I don't know whether the child was happy with Mrs. Reed, but she stayed there ten years until she went to Lowood School, where you were yourself. In fact, it seems her life was quite similar to yours. She became a teacher at Lowood, as you did, and then became a governess in the house of a certain Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rivers, I interrupted, unable to keep silent. I can imagine how you feel, he replied, but wait till I've finished. I don't know anything about Mr. Rochester's character, but I do know that he offered to marry this young girl who only discovered during the wedding ceremony that he was in fact already married to a madwoman. 
The governess disappeared soon after this, and although investigations have been carried out, and advertisements placed in newspapers, and every effort made to find her, nobody knows where she's gone. But she must be found. Mr. Briggs, a lawyer, has something very important to tell her. Just tell me one thing, I said urgently. What about Mr. Rochester? How and where is he? What's he doing? Is he well? I know nothing about Mr. Rochester. Why don't you ask the name of the governess and why everybody is looking for her? Did Mr. Briggs write to Mr. Rochester? I asked. He did, but he received an answer not from him, but from the housekeeper and Mrs. Fairfax. I felt cold and unhappy. No doubt Mr. Rochester had left England for a life of wild pleasure in the cities of Europe. That was what I had been afraid of. Oh, my poor master, once almost my husband, who I had often called my dear Edward. As you won't ask the governess's name, I'll tell you myself, continued St. John. I've got it written down. It's always better to have facts in black and white and he took out of his wallet a tiny piece of paper, which I recognised as part of my sketchbook, and showed it to me. On it I read in my own writing, Jane Eyre, which I must have written without thinking. The advertisements in Briggs spoke of a Jane Eyre, but I only knew a Jane Elliot, said St. John. Are you Jane Eyre? Yes. Yes, but doesn't Mr. Briggs know anything about Mr. Rochester? I asked desperately. I don't think Briggs is at all interested in Mr. Rochester. You're forgetting the really important thing. Don't you want to know why he's been looking for you? Well, what did he want? I asked almost rudely. Only to tell you that your uncle, Mr. Heir of Madeira, is dead. That he has left you all his property, and that you're now rich. Only that, nothing more. Rich. One moment I was poor, the next moment I was wealthy. It was hard to realise my new situation. A fortune brings serious worries and responsibilities with it, which I could hardly imagine. I was sorry to hear that my uncle, my only surviving relation, was dead. However, the inheritance would give me independence for life, and I was glad of that. Perhaps you'd like to know how much you've inherited, offered St. John politely. It's nothing much, really. Just twenty thousand pounds, I think. Twenty thousand pounds? The news took my breath away. St. John, who I had never heard laugh before, actually laughed out loud at my shocked face. Perhaps, perhaps you've made a mistake, I asked him nervously. No. Nope. There's no mistake. Now I must be leaving. Good night. He was about to open the door when suddenly I called, Stop! Why did Mr. Briggs write to you in order to find me? Oh, I'm a vicar. I have ways of discovering things. No, that doesn't satisfy me. Tell me the truth, I insisted, putting myself between him and the door. Well, I'd rather not tell you just now, but I suppose you'll discover it sooner or later. Did you know that my full name is St. John Eyre Rivers? No, I, I didn't. But then what... And I stopped as light flooded my mind and I saw clearly the chain of circumstances which connected us. But St. John continued his explanation. My mother's name was Eyre, he said. She had two brothers, one a vicar who married Miss Jane Reed of Gateshead, and the other John Eyre of Madeira. Mr. Briggs, Mr. Eyre's lawyer, wrote to us, telling us that our uncle had died and left all his property, not to us, because of his quarrel with our father, but to his brother's daughter. Then Mr. Briggs wrote again later, saying this girl could not be found. Well, I've found her. He moved towards the door, his hat in his hand. Wait a moment. Just let me think, I said. 
So you, Diana, and Mary are my cousins. We are your cousins, yes, he said, waiting patiently. As I looked at him, it seemed I had found a brother and sisters to love and be proud of for the rest of my life. The people who had saved my life were my close relations. This was wealth indeed to a lonely heart, brighter and more life-giving than the heavy responsibility of coins and gold. Oh, I'm glad. I'm so glad, I cried laughing. St. John smiled. You were serious when I told you you had inherited a fortune. Now you're excited about something very unimportant. What can you mean? It may mean nothing to you. You already have sisters and don't need any more family. But I had nobody, and now I suddenly have three relations in my world. Or two, if you don't want to be counted. I walked rapidly round the room, my thoughts rising so fast... I could hardly understand them. The family I now had, the people who had saved me from starvation, I could now help them. There were four of us, cousins. Twenty thousand pounds shared equally would be five thousand pounds each, more than enough for each one of us. It would be a fair and just arrangement, and we would all be happy. I would no longer have the worry of controlling a large amount of money, and they would never have to work again. We would all be able to spend more time together at Moore House. Naturally, when I made this suggestion to St. John and his sisters, they protested strongly, and it was with great difficulty that I finally managed to convince them of my firm intention to carry out this plan. In the end... They agreed that it was a fair way of sharing the inheritance, and so the legal steps were taken to transfer equal shares to all of us. Chapter 23 A Voice from the Past I promised to stay at Morton School until Christmas, when St. John would be able to find another teacher. He was there when I closed the school for the Christmas holidays, I was quite sorry to have to say goodbye to some of my pupils. You see what progress they have made, and you've only worked here a few months, he said. Imagine how much more good you could do if you gave your whole life to teaching. Yes, I answered, but I couldn't do it forever. Don't mention school. I'm on holiday now. He looked serious. What are your plans? I want you to let me have Hannah for a few days. She and I are going to clean more house from top to bottom and make all the Christmas preparations that you know nothing about being only a man. Everything must be ready for Diana and Mary when they come home next week for a really wonderful holiday. St. John smiled, but he was still not satisfied with me. That's all right for the moment, but I hope, Jane that you'll look higher than domestic activity and think about a better way of using your energy and intelligence in the service of God. St. John, I have so many reasons for happiness. I am determined to be happy despite your scolding. That week, Hannah and I worked harder than we had ever worked in our lives before, but at last all was ready. It was a delight to see Diana's and Mary's faces when they arrived cold and stiff from their long journey and saw the warm fires and polished furniture and smelt the cakes and meat dishes cooking. We three spent the whole of Christmas week in perfect happiness. The air of the moors, the freedom of home and the beginning of independence made Diana and Mary happier than I had ever seen them. Only St. John remained apart from our conversations and laughter. He continued his serious studies and spent much time visiting the sick as usual. Do you still intend to be a missionary? Diana asked him once, a little sadly. Nothing has changed or will change my plans, he answered. I shall leave England in a few months' time. And Rosamond Oliver? asked Mary gently. Rosamond Oliver is engaged to a Mr. Granby, 
a very suitable young man, according to her father. His face was calm. I realised he had managed to overcome what he called his weakness. Gradually, our life at Moore House lost its holiday feeling, and as we took up our usual habits and regular studies again, St. John sat with us more often. Sometimes I had the impression he was observing us. One day, when Diana and Mary were out and I was learning German, he suddenly said to me, I want you to learn Hindustani instead of German. I'll need it for my missionary work in India, and you could help me to learn it by studying with me. I've chosen you because I've noticed you have better powers of concentration than either of my sisters. It seemed so important to him that I could not refuse, and when his sisters returned, they were surprised to find me learning Hindustani with Sinjin. From now on, we spent a lot of time together studying. I had to work very hard to satisfy him. Under his influence, however, I felt I was losing my freedom to be myself. I could no longer talk or laugh freely, as I knew he only approved of serious moods and studies. I fell under his freezing spell, obeying all his commands without thinking. One evening at bedtime, as he kissed his sister's good night and was holding out his hand to shake mine as usual, Diana said, laughing, St. John, you aren't treating Jane like one of the family. You should kiss her too. I was rather embarrassed, but St. John calmly kissed me and did so every evening after that. I had not forgotten Mr. Rochester in all these changes of home and fortune. His name was written on my heart and would stay there as long as I lived. Not only had I written to ask Mr. Briggs more about him, I had also written twice to Mrs. Fairfax, but after I had waited in vain for six months, I lost hope and felt low indeed. Diana said I looked ill and needed a holiday at the seaside, but St. John thought I ought to concentrate on more serious work and gave me even more Hindustani exercises to do. One day, while he and I were walking on the moors, he announced, Jane, I'll be leaving in six weeks. You're doing God's work. He'll protect you, I replied. Yes, it seems strange to me that all my friends don't want to join me. God offers a place in heaven to all who serve him. What does your heart say to that, Jane? My heart is silent. My heart is silent, I murmured. Then I must speak for it, said the deep, stern voice. Jane, come with me to India as a missionary. Was it a call from God? I felt as if I was under a terrible spell, and I trembled afraid that I might not be able to escape. Oh, St. John, don't choose me, I begged. But it was useless appealing to a man who always did what he believed to be his duty, however unpleasant it was. God intended you to be a missionary's wife, he continued. Trust in him, Jane. Marry me for the service of God. I can't do it, St. John. I'm not strong enough, I cried. The iron bars of a cage seemed to be closing in around me. I've seen how hard you can work, Jane. You will be a great help to me with Indian women and in Indian schools. I thought, yes, I could do that, but I know that he doesn't love me, and despite that, he asked me to marry him. So I said, I'm ready to go with you to India but as a sister, not as a wife. He shook his head. You must see that's impossible. No, a sister could marry at any time and leave me. I need a wife who will obey me in life and who will stay with me until death. I trembled as I felt his power over me already. I'll give my heart to God, I said. You don't want it. As I looked at his stern face, I knew I could go anywhere in the world with him as a colleague, but I could never lose my freedom by marrying him. I'll ask you again in a few days' time, he said. 
And remember, it isn't me you're refusing, but God. From then on, his manner towards me was as cold as ice, which caused me great pain. I began to understand how, if I were his wife, this good religious man could soon kill me without feeling any guilt at all. When he asked me again, we were alone in the sitting room. He put his hand on my head and spoke quietly in his deep, sincere voice. Remember, Jane, God calls us to work for him and will reward us for it. Say you will marry me and earn your place in heaven. I admired and respected him, and under his touch my mind was changing. I was tempted to stop struggling against him, as I had been tempted before, in a different way, by Mr. Rochester. The missionary gently held my hand. I could resist his anger, but not his gentleness. I desperately wanted to do what was right. If I felt certain, I answered finally, that God really wanted me to marry you, I would agree. My prayers are heard, cried St. John. Close together we stood, waiting for a sign from heaven. I was more excited than I had ever been before. There was a total silence in the house, and the room was full of moonlight. Suddenly my heart stopped beating, and I heard a distant voice cry, Jane, Jane, Jane! Nothing more. Where did it come from? It was the voice of Edward Rochester, and it spoke in sadness and in pain. I'm coming, I cried. Wait for me. I ran into the garden, calling. Where are you? Only the hills sent a faint echo back. I broke away from St. John, who had followed, asking me questions. It was my time to give orders now. I told him to leave me, and he obeyed. In my room, I fell to my knees to thank God for the sign he had sent me, and waited eagerly for daylight. Part 5. A Wife at Ferndean Manor Chapter 24. Returning to Thornfield In the morning, I explained to Diana and Mary that I had to go on a journey and would be away for several days. Although they did not know the reason for my journey, they were far too sensitive to my feelings to bother me with questions. And so I walked to Whitcross, the lonely crossroads on the moor, where I had arrived a year ago with no money or luggage. I took the coach, and after thirty-six hours of travelling, I got down at Thornfield Village, and almost ran across the fields in my hurry to see the well-known house again and its owner. I decided to approach from the front to get the best view of the house. From there, I would be able to see my master's window. He might even be walking in the gardens, I thought, and I could run to him, touch him. Surely that wouldn't hurt anybody. But when I reached the great stone columns of the main gate, I stood still in horror. There, where I'd hoped to see a fine, impressive house, was nothing but a blackened heap of stones, with the silence of death about it. No wonder that letters addressed to people here had never received an answer. There must have been a great fire. How had it started? Had any lives been lost? I ran back to the village to find answers to my questions. Well, ma'am, the hotel owner told me, I was one of Mr. Rochester's servants at the time, and I can tell you it was his mad wife who started the fire in the governess's room. The master had been wildly in love with the governess, you see, ma'am, although she was just a plain little thing. Uh, and when she disappeared, he almost went mad. His wife must have understood enough to be jealous of the girl. Anyway, in the fire, the master risked his life helping all the servants out of the house, then bravely went back to save the madwoman. We saw her jump from the roof and fall to her death, but because he went back to help her, he was badly injured in the fire, losing a hand and the sight of both eyes. Very sad, ma'am. Where is he now? I asked urgently. 
at another house of his, Ferndean Manor, thirty miles away. I hired a carriage to drive there at once. Chapter 25 Finding Mr. Rochester Again Ferndean Manor was a large old house in the middle of a wood. It looked dark and lonely, surrounded by trees. As I approached, the narrow front door opened, and out came a figure I could not fail to recognise, Edward Rochester. I held my breath as I watched, feeling a mixture of happiness and sadness. He looked as strong as before, and his hair was still black, but in his face I saw a bitter, desperate look that I'd never seen there before. He walked slowly and hesitatingly along the path. Although he kept looking up eagerly at the sky, it was obvious that he could see nothing. After a while he stopped and stood quietly there, the rain falling fast on his bent, uncovered head. Finally, he found his way painfully back to the house and closed the door. When I knocked at the door, Mr. Rochester's old servant, John, opened it and recognised me. He and his wife, Mary, were the only servants their master had wanted to keep when he moved from Thornfield. Although they were surprised to see me, I had no difficulty in arranging to stay at Ferndean that night. But he may not want to see you, warned Mary, as we sat together in the kitchen. He refuses to see anybody except us. She was lighting some candles. He always wants candles in the sitting room when it's dark, even though he's blind. Give them to me, Mary, I said. I'll take them to him. The blind man was sitting near the neglected fire in the dark room. Put down the candles, Mary, he sighed. Here they are, sir, I said. That is Mary, isn't it? He asked, listening carefully. Mary's in the kitchen. I answered. What sweet madness has seized me, he cried suddenly. Where is the speaker? I can't see, but I must feel or my heart will stop and my brain will burst. Let me touch you or I can't live. I held his wandering hand with both of mine. Is it Jane? This is her shape. He released his hand and seized my arm, shoulder, neck, waist and held me close to him she is here i said and her heart too i'm jane eyre i found you and come back to you my living darling so you aren't lying dead in a ditch somewhere is it a dream i dream so often of you only to wake in the morning abandoned my life dark my soul thirsty i'm alive and I'm not a dream. In fact, I'm an independent woman now. I've inherited five thousand pounds from my uncle. Oh, that sounds real. I couldn't dream that. But perhaps you have friends now, and don't want to spend much time in a lonely house with a blind man like me. I can do what I like, and I intend to stay with you, unless you object. I'll be your neighbour, your nurse, your housekeeper, your companion. You will never be sad or lonely as long as I live. He did not reply immediately, and I was a little embarrassed by his silence. I had assumed he would still want me to be his wife, and wondered why he did not ask me. Jane, he said sadly, you cannot always be my nurse. It's kind and generous of you, but you're young, and one day you will want to marry. If I could only see, I'd try to make you love me again, but... And he sighed deeply. I was very relieved to discover that was all he was worrying about, because I knew that his blindness made no difference at all to my love for him. However, I thought too much excitement was not good for him, so I talked of other things and made him laugh a little. As we separated at bedtime, he asked me, just one thing, Jane. Were there only ladies in the house where you've been? I laughed and escaped upstairs, still laughing. A good idea, I thought. A little jealousy will stop him feeling so sorry for himself. Next day, 
I took him outside for a long walk in the fresh air. I described the beauty of the fields and sky to him as we sat close together in the shade of a tree. Tell me, Jane, what happened to you when you so cruelly abandoned me? He asked, holding me tightly in his arms. And so I told him my story. Naturally, he was interested in St. John Rivers, my cousin. Is St. John? Do you like him? He's a very good man. I couldn't help liking him. He's perhaps a man of 50 or so. St. John is only 29, sir. Rather stupid, I think you said. Not at all intelligent. He has an excellent brain, sir. Did you say he was rather plain? Ugly, in fact. St. John is a handsome man. Tall and fair, with blue eyes. Mr. Rochester frowned and swore loudly. In fact, sir, I continued, he asked me to marry him. Well, Jane, leave me and go. Oh, until now I thought you would never love another man. But go and marry Rivers. I can never marry him, sir. He doesn't love me, and I don't love him. He's good and great, but as cold as ice. You needn't be jealous, sir. All my heart is yours. He kissed me. I'm no better than the great tree hit by lightning at Thornfield, he said. I can't expect to have a fresh young plant like you by my side all my life. You are still strong, sir, and young plants need the strength and safety of a tree to support them. Jane, will you marry me? A poor blind man with one hand, twenty years older than you? Yes, sir. My darling, we'll be married in three days' time, Jane. Thank God. You know, I never thought much of religion. Well, lately, I've begun to understand that God has been punishing me for my pride and my past wickedness. Last Monday night, in a mood of deep depression, I was sitting by an open window, praying for a little peace and happiness in my dark life. In my heart and soul, I wanted you. I cried out, Jane, three times. Last Monday night, about midnight, I asked, wondering. Yes, but that doesn't matter. This is what's really strange. I heard a voice calling, I'm coming, wait for me, and where are you? And then I heard an echo sent back by hills, but there's no echo here in the middle of the wood. Jane, you must have been asleep. Your spirit and mine must have met to comfort each other. It was your voice I heard. I did not tell him I had actually spoken those words many miles away at that exact moment on that night, because I could hardly understand how it happened myself. I thank God, said Edward Rochester, and ask him to help me live a better life in future. Together we returned slowly to Ferndean Manor, Edward leaning on my shoulder. We had a quiet wedding. I wrote to tell the Rivers the news. Diana and Mary wrote back with delighted congratulations, but St. John did not reply. Now I have been married for ten years. I know what it is like to love and be loved. No woman has ever been closer to her husband than I am to Edward. I am my husband's life, and he is mine. We are always together and have never had enough of each other's company. After two years, his sight began to return in one eye. Now he can see a little. And when our first child was born and put into his arms, he was able to see that the boy had inherited his fine, large black eyes. Mrs. Fairfax is retired, and Adele has grown into a charming young woman. Diana and Mary are both married, and we visit them once a year. St. John achieved his ambition by going to India as planned and is still there. He writes to me regularly. He is unmarried and will never marry now. He knows that the end of his life is near, but he has no fear of death and looks forward to gaining his place in heaven.